Alrighty, now that we've got our project set up on Perforce, remember inside of the working folder, all right, here's our project on Perforce, and we have this project loaded in Unity. All right, way to make sure that it is this project is notice the name up here. Along the top bar of Unity, it shows you the version you're running in, the scene that you're in, right? I'm in the hub scene.unity, that's the scene file, and here is the project. So there's my name and then 1705. If I look at Perforce or in my file explorer, either one, right, you see there is that is my project folder. So if you're up here and you see this is the project template, either one of two things has happened. Either you copy and paste it and you didn't rename it, or you're actually working in the project template, which is way down here in Perforce. If this is a project you're working in, you're not going to be actually able to submit your changes. So make sure that you've done the first part of this where you set up your project in the working folder. Here's mine right here. All right, now that I'm in the hub scene, I encourage everybody, to, before you even get started working, make sure your character is working, right? I can run around the hub. You should have already at least played around and tested this, but make sure everything is working. You're not getting any other errors, uh, that everything that was set up is still working properly. All right, a little bit about this project, what we've been given you, uh, what you've been uh, given is this ask core folder. Right, this is the meat and potatoes of, of our systems, of our character, of the grab null, of the inventory. Uh, everything that you're going to be designing with um, is based in this folder. So feel free to poke around in here, look at it, open up some of the scripts, see how things are working, but don't change any of it. Uh, in future months, you'll be able to adjust some of this as a team, um, but this is basically the system, so stay out of this folder. What you're really going to be editing is... Uh, the scenes down here. Basically what we're going to be doing for the first few assignments is just checking out the scenes, uh, working on them, and submitting our work to Perforce as well as submitting the assignment for a grade. Right, so the Ascore folder is where all the system is running. The scenes is um, basically where our scenes are held. We have the hub as well as the scenes for the IND229 uh, class, which is this class here. Um, these four scenes are what you're going to be tasked with. These are your four technical assignments or experiments for the month. All right, so starting with the visuals assignment, that's this first week. So um, we're going to be using the uh, multi-scene editing feature um, that Unity has added since uh, version 5.3. Uh, it's been a very, very big help um, for working with multiple scenes at once. Right, and now if you've played any games like Grand Theft Auto, Crackdown, um, you know, Oblivion, any large, massive game, Skyrim, any of those games where it's a big open world, um, those games are never often just one scene, right? That's so much to be building on one scene. It's a collection of scenes. So that way they can dynamically unload and load parts of that uh, when the character is nearby, right? Or then you, you can have different scenes that you load individually, you know, transitioning from one large city to the next. So all of this, um, this information is what we're going to be working with as well. Uh, and the reason why we're doing this in two scenes now, rather than saying, well, why can't I just build my scene in the hub, uh, we're getting you used to practicing with what you're going to be doing in the future, right, in the next two months. Uh, you're going to build your own level in level design, which is this folder down here. The student name folder is going to be where your level design work goes. Uh, and then you're going to bring this together as a team. So each uh, scene is going to be separate, uh, and you're going to go transition from one student's area to the next uh, very seamlessly. All right, so to use the multi-scene editing, all right, we can, in instead of just double-clicking right on this scene here, right, if I double-click on the scene, it's going to ask, do I want to open the scene, you know, do I want to save the hub? I'm going to cancel that, and if you drag it into the scene editor, right, it's not letting you. You have to drag your scene into the hierarchy. Right? When I drag the visual scene into the hierarchy and let go, you'll see I have two scenes now in my hierarchy view. right? And this basically just, think of this as the scene is now the parent to all of the child objects that are actually in the scene. right? That's it's basically just adding another layer to the hierarchy. And now you'll notice that we have the hub scene and the visual scene, right? Notice how the hub scene is bold, right? The text is bold, and the visual scene is just in plain text. This is showing you which the which one is the active scene, right? The active scene means whichever one that you, um, whatever uh, objects are created or things that you're modifying is going to be applied to that specific scene. 
So it's always good to set the active scene for whichever one that you're working on. So before I get started and actually make any changes, um, I want to first go to Perforce and check this out. Right? And when I say this, I'm referring to the scene. Right? For now, the very first assignment, all we're going to be doing is just working on this visual scene. So before you start working, go ahead and check out the scene itself and the meta file. All right, I'm going to check them out and make sure that goes to my pending change list here. Right here is the list. Right, I'm telling Perforce or you know my teammates in the future, hey, I'm working on this scene. Um, this is now editable or writable uh, on my computer, and I'm making changes on this. Uh, another helpful command, right, is this lock. If you want to just lock your files, right, or that file, that means no one can touch it or change it. Um, while you're working on it, right? So that you can lock your own files. Uh, it's just another way to communicate, hey, I'm working on this. Um, don't make any other changes. And at any point, you can always unlock right down here. All right, so I checked out the visual scene, right? So I'm going to go ahead and set this one to my active scene. All right, now you'll see it picks up the actual lighting from that scene itself, right? So we don't have any lights in the scene, so it's very dark. This button right here will toggle off the scene lighting, right? It's just going to show us uh, default editor lighting, make it much e making it much easier to actually work, right? And here's the scene itself. You see I was already doing a little work and messing around in here. Let's go ahead and just delete some of this stuff, and I can create some other objects as I'm explaining what the level blocking meshes are. But here is the scene. This is what you will, will see when you open up yours. This level geo, which is just the base cylinder, and then the player start icon, right? I'm going to explain more about what that, that is, and you may have seen that in the instructions. Okay, so this platform here is where you're going to be building your first uh, scene, right? I provided a visuals image inside the announcements for the class. So check that out. Um, feel free to replace this as much or as little as you like. If you want, you know, I don't want to have a cylinder, remove this and make a larger quad. Or if you want to make your own piece of terrain, anything you want to do, you can do in this space. Right, so first thing what I'm going to do is um, just create some level blocking meshes and explain uh, why they're great and why you should use them for building and blocking out your level as opposed to the Unity uh, 3D primitive objects, right? So now that you see my IND2 scene is the um, is the active scene. When I go ahead and create a level blocking cube, notice how that cube is created in this scene. All right, so there's a level blocking cube. Let's go ahead and put it down here on the ground. All right, now what I'm also going to do is I'm just going to create a Unity primitive. So we can compare the two. So there's definitely instances where unity primitives are useful, um, but in terms of blocking out a level and actually making this level polished and finished, um, the unity primitives don't allow us to texture it very well. You can apply materials to them, um, but the issue with them is that now you have to start affecting the tiling of the material itself, creating a lot of duplicate materials. All right. So here is the um, Unity primitive and let's go ahead and apply this utility grid so if you just search the project for utility you'll see this utility grid if you apply this material onto the object now these two look identical right because it's a one by one cube you can't even tell the difference between these two objects but um, notice now if I go to make this object bigger Right, so here's the unity primitive. As I make it larger, right, say I want to make this a brick wall, or I'm making some type of wall on my, on the side of my uh, level. All right, as I make this bigger, look what's happening to the texture, right? It's starting to distort and skew. This actually has to do with the object's UVs. If anyone knows that term, uh, that's referring to uh, this UV coordinates, which is how you actually apply a texture or material to an object. Right, getting it to display to the renderer uh, how the artist would like it to. Right, so this is not adjusting or changing the UVs. As I move this, 
the object UVs are staying the same, and it's just skewing it and making it worse and worse uh, the more distorted it becomes. The level blocking meshes, however, notice uh, you have this small little pink sphere on the object in the other corner, right? So I can select that sphere, and you see you get another move widget that's not a bug that's actually um, designed to be that way. So this is going to adjust the object's uh, transform, right, where it's located in space. Uh, and if you're not wondering how I'm snapping it on the grid like this, that's the control button. So if you go to Edit Snap Settings, you'll see this window here. You can't dock this anywhere. This is just a free-floating window. So um, by default, it should be uh, 1 in the X, Y, and Z, 0.1 for scale, and 15 degrees rotation. Right? So you can see, um, because our grid is you know, textured in a way it, it, as a grid, you're seeing it's moving on one unit. Right? Uh, if you rotate, you can... Um, hold down control and it will rotate on that increment. So if you ever want to adjust this, say you're doing larger block outs and you want to adjust it 45, so when you don't have to do as much, you see now it's a 45. All right, and as you're seeing them rotating, you may be noticing about where the object is rotating from. All right, that is the, the pivot point of the object. But before I get to that, let me talk a little bit more about this pink ball right here. All right, when I select this object and move, Holding down control, um, this is adjusting the object's scale, right? And if you notice, um, as I'm adjusting it and making it larger, look what's happening with the texture. It's starting to tile and repeat itself. That, again, is the object's UVs. As this object is becoming larger, we're adjusting the UVs uh, at the same time, right, to preserve that, those coordinates. So when we actually go and put some textures on this, right, you may even notice now the difference between these two. If you put a brick texture on this wall, it's going to tile and look very nice. This one over here, not so much, right? It's going to be skewed and distorted. Whatever you're seeing in the grid, that is what the texture is going to show up as. So when you're starting to build your level and block everything out, if you notice things are skewing, when you go and put um, when you go and put actual uh, textures on it, it's going to look the exact same. Right, and the importance of snapping uh, is just to keep these clean values, right? If you just start moving this on a small, you'll get these very strange decimals, right? By holding down control, it's stopping that from happening. Same thing on movement, right? Keeping these whole values make it much easier to plan out and build your level than if things are decimal points uh, or, you know, fractions or anything like that that are harder to work with. If you need to add or subtract these numbers or get those distances for any reason, um, it, you're just making it harder on yourself, as well as that professional quality. Right? So when you're adjusting this, when you're moving this pink ball, you're affecting the object's scale. Right? Same thing as just holding down scale and you know, doing it from here. Right? Same, same accomplishment, just different way. Okay, so um, a little bit that was a little bit about the textures. Now back to just the pivots. Right. So if we look at a unity primitive, the look where it's pivoting from, right? It's from the center location. You'll see this button up here, right? We have this pivot and global button. We're going to talk about this one next week uh, when we do the wind turbine. This pivot right here, if you click on it, right, this will switch from the object's pivot point to the center point. All right? So the pivot of an object is something that you can set. Something that an artist uh, inside of Maya, you know, designer is definitely capable of, do, of doing this as well. Um, there's other content that I have that show you how to set that in Maya. You can set an object's pivot to be where you want it to. So when it comes into the game engine, you can rotate it from a location or animate it to swing on a certain way or use that pivot to your advantage when you're building uh, whatever it is that you're, you're working on. But for the Unity primitives, right, the pivot is the center. Right, so when you switch this to center, what this is putting is the, the object's um, pivot point or the widget is going to go to the center of an object. If you group a bunch of objects together, it's going to average and go to the center point or the center location of all of them. So unity primitives are the pivot is the center. That's just how it is. Level blocking meshes, you've already noticed, right? our pivot is at the corner of the object. So when you go ahead and actually start to, you know, block out a level or build something, you can very easily, if I go ahead and just duplicate this, 
right? I can very easily rotate and snap around that corner uh, very nicely and very cleanly. So because of this, this really gives you a lot of flexibility and control and speed in being able to adjust this how you want it to, right? Having it right on that corner. If you try and do the same thing with the uh, Unity primitives, uh, it's not as fast. Yes, you can still get that um, that level of detail, um, but not as not as quickly. Right, very clean, always coming from the corner. Right, that's something that was designed as an artist, um, a technical artist, to make it easier for whoever's using the tool. Right, so if I wanted to just duplicate this and try and, you know, rot now I have to you know rotate it around. Let's move it back. And still, we got this little gap, so we want to. Oh, uh, this brings up a good point to where if you get off like this, right? See, my position is not as all. Um, all messy with the decimals. You can, you know, go in and physically type in the numbers, but in the snap settings, you have the snap all axes and snap specific axes. So if I want to snap it to the Y, it's just going to round it up, right? It's going to round to the nearest value. So let me just put that back to zero or 0.5, right? So then if I want to snap in the X, right, it's going to round it for me to eight. So there we go. Now it's nice and clean. Let's do the same for this one. Snap it in the X and the Z. And I know this I want to be 0.5. All right. So now we've got everything snapped easily for us. And see, even, even then, getting this to line up how I want it, just like with the level blocking meshes is taking a little bit more effort, right? Because I have the small gap and you can move it in close to try and get it, um, you know, in place, but you really need to have those clean values um, and everything efficient, right? That that small little gap, those small little differences are, are easily noticeable. So uh, that's going to take your, your work to the next level. If you're taking that time to get that attention to detail and everything clean, um, and this is part of the issue with with some of the Unity primitives, so why the, the level blocking meshes are, are stronger and better. So um, one thing in terms of grouping with these objects, right, it's important to have a clean scale value, um, but then um, when we talk about forming a parent-child relationship, uh, remember that every time that you drop everything into an, an empty game object, right here we have level geo, um, right, we have that in place, See how it has a clean scale value of 1? I'm just going to go ahead and create an empty game object. I see this issue a lot, very often. Um, not sure how this ends up happening, but I'm going to explain um, why it's happening and, and how to correct it. So you can create an empty game object, right? If you want to, like, say I made this wall and I want to make a prefab or a group out of it, then I can duplicate the group. Right. All right, where is that game object? So... One good trick, if you create a game object, and here's a good example, it's all way out in space. If you hold down V, as in Victor, see how your the widget turns from that 3D cube uh, that shows each plane to uh, just a white square? V, as in Victor, is going to allow you to snap to other vertices, right? A vertice is where two edges meet, right, or three edges meet on, a, on an object, right? So if I hold down V and now snap, right, I can move it to where I want the object located. Right? <clears throat> so say I want this whole wall group to be pivoting from right here, right right on the corner. Or actually, that would be better to be right down here. Right, so now this game object, let's call this wall group. I could type. All right, so notice that it is, still has a clean scale value of 1. So if I take these two walls, right, they're still LBM cubes. If I take those and put them in wall group, Notice how the texture stays the same, right? I dropped them in and it didn't skew or distort. Now I can take wall group and move this around anywhere I want to. But for some reason, I often see scale, um, empty game object, right? Completely empty, no mesh render or anything with a scale value on this. So let's just make this bigger. And you'll see visually it doesn't do anything, right? There's no change. I actually just type in some long number, right? It visually 
wall group, right, it's just an empty game object, so you can't see it. But now when I go ahead and drop in my two objects, right, notice how one of them broke, right? This one completely is, is starting to break, and that's because the cube is inheriting the scale value from its parent, right? So it's inheriting these values because it's a child. So that issue is because you have something other than one on the empty game object. So go put this back to one, and now that yeah, when you reselect them, it should refresh, and now put them back inside the group. All right, you should see it maintain that scale. So you can group them together, um, but notice that you have to uh, you have to make sure that you're um, having a clean, empty game object. All right, so going to the actual level blocking mesh, you'll see that this is just a game object, right? We have a, a box collider, a transform, a mesh renderer, just like you have with a cube, right? Transform, box collider, mesh renderer, it's all the same setup, except down here we have this script, and this is why these are so powerful. So down here we have the texture tiling and positioning. So if I want this to say tile twice as much, I can adjust this and set this to two. Right? And now I can be tiling twice as much. Notice how they're independent from each other. So an issue that comes with the, the Unity primitives when you're uh, texturing them right, is this is all skewed and distorted. So if I want to correct this and make this grid look just, just like this one over here, notice I can't adjust it on the game object. I need to go to the actual material. Right Here's the material itself. So if I go ahead and start changing this tiling value, right, the first one up here, this is this one down here is for a secondary map. We want to do it right here in the main map. If you go ahead and adjust this tiling, look what's happening. Everything in the level is changing now, right? It's it's applying everything that this uh, this material is applied to is now being affected. So what this means is for every object that you want to have the same brick material or the same object to look like the same material, it's going to have to have multiple duplicates of the same material, right? And that's just extra space in your project that you don't need. So a huge benefit of the level blocking meshes is you can customize each object to be what you need it to be. Oh, I was just a, so not like that, of course, not the material right here in the level in the component itself. All right, so that's just the cube, right? Base, it's, that's the base um, concept of these. The texture positioning you can use to adjust as well. You know, if you find a part of a texture and you just want to scooch it over, or, you know, a little bit fine, a little bit more fine detail, you can adjust where it's located on the object. All right, so yeah, that's just the cube, right? That's the base using the this here, holding down control to scale it this way. Um, you know, rotating the pivots. Um, that's just the base of the level blocking cube. If you look at the other shapes, right, right, that's just the cube. The wedge um, is very popular uh, and very useful, in my opinion. One shape that Unity doesn't have that definitely um, helps out, right? So I can use this. This can be used as a, a ramp, or even you can turn off the the mesh render. And this collider is great for any type of slope or any type of staircase um, to use, right? You can just remove this component altogether. Uh, the same thing, right? Little pink sphere. You can move it in place, uh, adjust the angle of it, and then yeah, same texture tiling and positioning, right? So these are are very useful, and also adding good angles and details to the level, right? We have that that wedge, and then there's a, a corner in, right? So this is really good, just finishing corners. Right, like that, and then there's a corner out. Oops. There we go. So all different shapes and angles that you can utilize, and they all do have these. 
Some of them will give you different results, so you know you can use them to, to tweak in small adjustments. So those are the wedges. Uh, the slope is also uh, a good piece, just similar to like the base wedge, except not a full piece, just a, a small slot. Um, but these can be good for little walkways and things like that, um, because you'll notice that they are flush with the ground. Let me get it out of the wall. Right, it can be flush with the ground like this, and then you have um, the slope and the height. Right, so if I move this, move this to be closer to the wall. Right, and you'll see as I'm moving it up, right, that's what I was adjusting. Right, if I go ahead and adjust the slope, right, it's the overall angle. Right, and um, I suggest using these sliders for any of these ranges. You accept that you see down here with the slide bar. The some of these are pretty finicky because these ranges are infinite. You know, it can go from basically zero to a pretty large number, so it can it can break sometimes. It's usually best to just type in a value for anything that's these radial button sliders. Um, and this is the overall width of the of the uh, slope itself, right? So the height is pretty much the angle, and then the the width is the thickness. But another really good shape because you'll see, yeah, it'll be coming flush with the other object. Um, then the other ones, you know, pyramid and cylinder, those are pretty self-explanatory. Um, you know, radius is the overall width. Again, you see there it's, it's breaking with that. So typing in values in here is usually best. Sections, you know, this is the number of sections around, right? So you see if it's really low, you can see what's called faceting. Right, so when you can actually detect and see things look angled like that, um, that's that's called faceting, right? So it looks a lot less quality than than uh, that your shape you're trying to provide. Um, but you don't want to go nuts with this, right? You don't need to set this to if this is a small pipe on the wall, right? Oops, not thirty, right? If this is a little pipe on the wall, something that's running along like this. Right, and it's small. Like say I'm way back here, or it's up up high on the ceiling, and I'm the character, and I can just see it like that. There's no reason to have it that detailed, right? If you look, and it's you know the let's say, it's, let me just duplicate it. Let me duplicate it so you can see the difference. Right, and look at all that detail. It's just unnecessary. Always think about the silhouette, right? What is the shape showing? What is the 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 usage of it, right? Let me just put this down to let's try ten. Right, uh, you can kind of see a little bit of it, but not that big of a deal. If you can step it up to 12, right now, there's basically you can barely even tell the difference between those. Right, that looks like the same object, but look at it in terms of in the density. Right, if I just turn on that. The convex that'll show you the the render the mesh render of it, All right? Look at there's the pretty much the wireframe and the geometry, and look at it's almost double the amount. So be careful, right? I, I'll show an example coming up here where you do want to be a bit more utilized. But think about the overall uh, think about the overall silhouette and what that shape is used for, right? If it's far away from the camera and it's very small, it doesn't need to be that dense in terms of the sections. All right, and then moving to the pretty much the the most exclusive um, piece of the level blocking meshes, and really the overall uh, most customizable shape is this little guy right here. So this wedge. Notice that the the level blocking meshes all come in with this prefix LBM underscore. Uh, what I recommend everybody doing is, well, of course, renaming these. Right, I should come into wall and say like this, you know wall and then say you know what these are actually named but keep the the overall thing to keep in mind is keep the uh, LBM underscore um, prefix right if you keep that in place um, that's going to allow you to actually search right so now I can actually do a search for LBM underscore right and find everything that's named that why that's going to be important is for grouping your objects together as well as moving it from one project to another um, as well as you may notice sometimes, a little bit of a side note, and I'll get back to the arch. Um, this mesh right here, right, if this ever gets broken or lost, sometimes if you make a prefab out of these or it gets disconnected like this, 
the object is still here, right? Here is wall two, but the mesh render is gone. We have this this um, command right here, level uh, refresh mesh under level blocking meshes, and that just repopulates it and fills that mesh in. So if that ever happens to you, you can utilize that. And if you keep LBM underscore, you can search for pretty much all of your re your objects and refresh them if you ever need to. So just a good way to keep your, your naming convention organized. All right, so going back to this uh, arch here, right, you'll see we have a few more uh, controls here, right? Same thing, texture, tiling, and position that we had before. And now we have this squared button. This basically is Boolean, true or false, right? So basically this will make a round or square um, arch, right? Then we have the sections, just like we had for the cylinder, right? So if we put 10... This actually increases the number of uh, faces around the around the arch itself, right? Number of sections make a more smooth, a smoother uh, archway, right? Now the radius, right? This is the overall radius of the arch, right? From the center point to the beginning of the archway, right? So if you put this up to uh, one, right? Now the 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 archway is larger. All right, now if going on to the start and bend angle, this is pretty much going to give you control of the size of the overall arch, right? Making this from 0 to 360 gives you something that's, you know, physically uh, enclosed, right? It's a complete circle, right? And then if you wanted to ever do that, right, now you have pretty much a, a pipe, right? There's a way to make a pipe out of a, an arch. So um, here's another good example of when you would want something to have more faces rather than less, right? So say, for example, we have this little guy here. So this is going to be the pipe on the wall that's maybe broken and spewing out water, right? So this is going to be maybe 0.25. No, it's too small, 0.4. And then we want to adjust the width, right? So that's a good example of showing the width. Uh, moving this down, this is the overall thickness of the pipe, right, or of the of the distance between the arch and the other geometry, right. So making that thinner or smaller makes the arch bigger, but keeps the same radius, right. So say here, this is a pipe that's spewing water on the wall, and now this one is ten sections. Let's leave that like that. Um, you know, angle it down so we can see it happening. All right, and now here, this is say maybe this is a big sewer vent or something large that the player actually walks through. So let me make this bigger. Let's say, I don't know, three. Sure, that looks good to start. Again, start with oops, start with whole values. Um, start with whole values. Don't um, just, you know, type in random numbers or just scale it bigger. Really actually put in a number and then test it from there. All right, so now you can really see that, you know, faceting, right? You can see this is maybe a, an older, you know, N64 game uh, where you can see that low poly um, uh, models. Uh, but now we can utilize that. So, again, having this at 100 is just not necessary, right? Here's 100, right? Look at all that geometry. Now let's say this one's 30. For what it's worth, I mean, yes, you can argue, oh, I can see a difference there. Um, but uh, really, can you? Can, can someone that's not looking for that see the difference? And uh, most cases, no, right? No one is going to take the time to be, oh, I can see where the faces are there. Um, this is all really has to do with performance, right? The reason why you can't, like, well, if you can't tell the difference, why can't I have this anyways? It's just about a performance and efficiency, right? That's the difference between film and games. If this was film and you're just taking a, a rendered image, sure, go nuts. Have as much detail as you want. But when you're designing environments that are dynamically uh, being interacted with and, you know, scripts that are running in the background and constantly, you want everything to be as, as smooth as possible. So I'm just going to put a few of these out here and then actually walk around with the player, right? So this one is um, way too much, 100. This one is 30. This one's back here is 20. And then let's just do one that's 10. All right, and then here's the same pipe. So this one's 10 sections. Let's make another one that's 20 just to see it in real time. And then this one over here that's 
six. All right, so here I am with the character. If you ever want to just move him for while you're testing, feel free. All right, so I use my flashlight, and you'll notice here, right, I can't really even see the difference. Same thing here. Obviously, six is a little low, um, but between the, the one on the left and the middle, not a big enough difference where it matters, right? Same thing, the cylinder's up there. But obviously, over here, this is obviously starting to push it, right? Anything large like this, you do want to add some detail to to avoid this 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 faceting, right? That's what this, that's what you, the actual technical term is called is faceting. All right, so um, let's go ahead and actually put some textures on some of these, and you can see um, how to how to actually um, adjust some of the the issues you might run into. All right, so I definitely recommend, and this is in the assignment. Uh, this website here, textures.com. So uh, this is a great website. Uh, you do have to use an account for this. Um, so make sure that you uh, create an account um, You know, using an email address. That's all you need. You don't have to put in any information. What's great about this website is it's completely free. right? It's royalty free. Um, you can use these uh, in your work, um, and you're not going to have any issues. Right, so how it works um, by having a free account is you get credits. Every day you're going to get 15 credits on your account. So what you can do is you can come to this website and download textures. Right, and those textures are uh, basically um, usually one credit for each one. Some of these, oh, here's a nice little free bundle. You can check that out. But some of the really nice expensive things, like you could get like a 3D brush or a 3D scan, Right, like if some of this stuff is is more than one credit, right? Like it's free, but it's five credits, right? You may see stuff like this, but you know this is more focused for art and things like that. Any of the textures you're getting are usually only one credit. So let's. Uh, I've been talking about brick a lot, so let's go look at the brick. Uh, let's see, brick. There it is. You can also search in here, right? Here is the brick category, right? And here's a bunch of subcategories. What do we want? Uh, block, cinder block. Medieval, modern, uh, let's go with uh, cinder block. And let's see, well, scraps is post-apocalyptic, so let's pick something that's dirty, right? So now I have 76 dirty textures to look at. Oh, my, that's a lot, right? But still, that's that's good. You have a lot to choose from and a lot to you know set yourself apart so that not everyone is using the exact same brick texture all the time. All right, and now it's not like, you know, don't just do Google and be like, all right, here we go, I'm done. Pick the first one that you see. Take a look at some of them and actually see what they look like. Uh, and what's great about these is they have this preview, right? So if I hit this preview here, this is what's going to show you when it actually tiles and repeats, right? So you may look at this and be like, oh, well, I can see that this same, pic this same spot over and over again. Or this may not be what you actually would like what you want, what you're envisioning, what you might think it looks like. So that preview really helps you to actually identify what it looks like before you actually go ahead and download it. So that one I just looked at, as well as, let's say, this one here, these are, right, and here's, they show you the preview in here, these are designed to tile in one direction, right? So basically it's meant to be on a wall or something that looks just like this. Right, you'll notice candy caning or striping. So keep that in mind. When you're picking these, notice this is designed to tile in one direction, not two. Um, this one's pretty good. Um, yeah, you can't really, when you look really far out, you can see it starts to look like an actual tile set, but it's not too bad, right? This is pretty good. And I mean, obviously, I'm not asking you um, as a designer to build these textures yourself and fix these minor issues. Um, but I'm just letting you know this is something you have control of. You can actually um, preview this stuff before you download it, and if you see it and visually notice it, um, you have control to just find something else or to um, do other things to, to cover that up. So if you find something that you like, right, you find a texture you like, right here you can see, you know, it says small, but honestly a 1024 by 1024 is a really large texture size. All right, we'll talk more about that uh, in the upcoming weeks, but that's that's big, right? They say small, but that's that's big for games, right? It might not be as big for film, but games is pretty large. 
So we can go ahead and download that. You'll see it's one credit, right? So that'll take away one of my credits for today. Um, and think about that, 15 credits a day. If you go on here even once or twice a week, right? If you don't even use all your credits every day, if you just go on here a few times a week and just pick, go through, pick some things you like, by the time you get to either, you know, DES 3 or even, you know, a few months from now, uh, you'll have a good texture library already ready to go. So there's the texture right there. Let's go find another one. It doesn't just tile one direction. Let's take a look at this one. Let's preview that. All right, cool. That looks pretty good to me. I can't really tell too much the, the repeating is, repetitive enough, repetitiveness of it. That's hard to say. All right, <clears throat> so let's download that one as well. All right, so I have those two textures, and Unity's great because they allow you this drag and drop feature. So what I'm going to do is go into this visuals folder here. So I was already doing a little bit of work in this, but what I recommend everybody doing is for this assignment, go ahead and actually um, go ahead and create a folder for this assignment, like I've done here for the visuals. The reason why I have you do this. Uh, is just to still understand file location and overall uh, folder structure and everything like that, right? So if you look in Show in Explorer, right, Unity has the same um, feature that Perforce has, that Show in Explorer feature. You'll see that's just a visuals folder in my project, right? That's where I'm going to put everything for this assignment. The reason why is just so you understand when I create that visuals folder, Right, it's going to be in the same place in my project. Right, there's that visuals folder, so I can check out things and mark things for add right from this folder. Obviously, in a full production project, right in the industry, scripts go in the scripts folder, art goes in the art folder, textures and textures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You don't have it broken down like this, but I want you to still just to understand uh, file location. Um, so, to take that, take the time to create that folder and anything you use for the project. Go ahead and put it in here. So I already have a brick one and two. Let's go ahead and create a brick three and four. And it's actually a good habit. I did it for my materials, but it's a good habit to get into to anything that's a texture. Do a T underscore. This is just my personal uh, recommendation. T underscore uh, the name, right? And then if you have a number associated with it, if there's a bunch of them. And then uh, for materials, do M underscore. You see I was slacking for my first two, but I'm going to go ahead and adjust that. One, four. Make it all consistent. All right, so if I wanted to change the name of these, I actually should just go to Perforce and check them out. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. So these materials, or these textures right here, go ahead and check these out. And I'm going to check out the meta files as well. So I think this is a, another issue now that I'm thinking about that often happens uh, where this isn't actually going to rename them how we want it to. So if we go ahead and change the name of these, let's go ahead and just do a test and see what, what Perforce does. So if I just go into Unity here and just do T underscore, right, I'm just going to rename that file. And now I'm going to come back to Perforce, and instead of submitting the entire change list, I'm just going to find that one I renamed, right, this one here. So this is what I actually renamed. You'll notice the file path, right? It's looking for that file with that name. So if I go ahead and submit this, I have a feeling I'm going to get an error. I'm doing that just to show everyone what might happen. So I can actually submit part of a change list. Notice I selected these files and then hit submit, right? So you'll see here I could say I want to submit all of them or I just want to submit these two, right? Just those two. And I'm going to say testing renaming a texture because I don't think this is going to work yep so this error here saying open for read looking for this brick texture it can't find the specified file right because I changed the name so that path technically doesn't exist anymore right now I get a bunch of errors and you know 
not knowing what's going on, things like that. And what Perp Wars actually did was, okay, okay, these files weren't working properly, so I'm going to take those ones out of your change list. So I'm left with everything in my change list here and uh, just have those, those files there. So the way you want to actually rename files is not by checking them out, right? If they're on the depot, you can't just check them out and rename them. If they're not on the depot, they're still just on your computer, you haven't submitted anything at all yet, you haven't marked them for add, feel free to rename them. But if you get yourself into this situation, I'm just going to go to this change list here and revert files, right? Get them back to the previous state. Now you see this change list here, right? This change list is just empty. Don't just let it sit there, right? Go ahead and just delete the change list. You'll only ever have that option when it's empty. And it looks like this brick that I checked out, this isn't going to work the way I wanted to either. So I'm also going to revert this change list. So a little bit of perforce troubleshooting on the side, but good information to, to have. So now those are back out of the change list. And if I look back in Unity, yeah, Unity should be smart. And uh, it pretty much it looks like it made a duplicate. Right, it made a duplicate. So let's go ahead and delete this one. We don't need it. But it, it pretty much reverted it back to its old state. Right, I've got that file back on my computer as it was. So if you do want to rename something, the way to do it, and let's just do it with the, the files, because the meta files should rewrite themselves, is we can right click on these files, or we'll do it one at a time, and let's look at right around the brick and just do rename. Rename slash move. So this little window is going to pop up. So this gives you to the option to do one or the other, right, or both if you wanted to, right? So let's type in the new name. Right? And now if we wanted to move it, right, we could change where the file is physically located or we could browse, you know, and select the folder where we want it to go. Right? But we could do one or the other, and then when I hit submit, Right, this is what it brings up. It immediately brings up a change list. And if you look, all this is doing is marking the old one for add and marking, um, or excuse me, marking the new one for add and marking the old one for delete. So it's basically taking out a step for you. All right, and now we've got that renamed as, as we wanted. Let's go ahead and do it for the other one. Just copy and paste, and then put T underscore. And all right, so now those meta files are going to need to be re-added. So if we look in my visuals folder, Unity should have, you should create those for me, right here, there. These two right here. So I can now mark those for add. So this may not mean necessarily something you have to follow along with, um, but this is just something that you should um, keep in mind for if you run into this issue where you had that warning where it can't find that specified file, that's why, is because the file got renamed. So, yeah, so now Unity's just gonna rebuild those for me. Right now I've got those renamed textures. And now in Perforce, Right. So I've been having this minor issue to where I see the, the meta files here, but they're not showing up in my workspace as they should be with a small piece of white paper. It looks like a, a blank paper showing that the icon. If I hit mark for add on my uh, visuals folder there and hit OK, I think it might find some files. Yeah, see they're there. Now they're popping up. So there's the new textures and the new meta files. So I'm going to put those in my change list as well as let's come back here and now let's go ahead and create my materials. So we got M underscore brick 03 and M underscore brick 04. All right, now I'm going to assign uh, three to three, right? So drop this one in the albedo channel of the main map. That's basically the color or the diffuse, there might be other terms for that. Right, uh, metallic, this would be uh, any type of uh, reflective map, right, any type of specular. A normal map you might see on uh, these websites. So some of the 
substances, I think, come with a, a normal map, right? So here, here's a new one. Let's take a look at this one, right? Here is multiple maps, right? Each one is one credit, but these all go together on one, uh, one material to make this texture, right? So this would be your a height map, right? This is overall heightness or uh, overall um, using this for displacement and things like that. Um, what we would more use more often in games would be this right here, the normal map, right? So this blue looking funny thing, this isn't anything that actually displays. This is showing um, basically the height, right? So when you shine your light on this, you'll see those bumps um, in those grooves, right? And that's actually built by an artist or generated in a program like Crazy Bump. You want to check out that. If any type of um, art interest at all, check out Crazy Bump because you can take any image and turn it into a normal map, right? And then you get that type of effect, right, on a flat object but that has that effect. It's a really good program. It's free to use. But there is normal maps in this website already generated. Uh, roughness, um, this looks like, let's see what we've got, would definitely be a detail mask, possibly, and a lot of this you can just plug some of these in, but you'll see like here's your metallic map and your ambient occlusion. If you look, metallic, ambient occlusion, right there, normal map, you know, height map, you can basically download all of these and just plug in the pieces, right? Each one of these maps, you could download all six of these get it in your, into one material that looks like this level of detail. That's not just, you know, a diffuse color, right? I'll show you uh, what this will look like, and then in a later video I'll have uh, setting up a more complicated material like that. But it's, it's honestly just dragging those specific names into those slots, and you'll see the level of detail, right? So I've got, um, looks like I've made a mistake, and I put, brick into brick three into brick four so let me change that and then three should have this one here right so if i go ahead and take brick three and put it on these walls take a look at what's going on right this is that candy caning or that striping that i was talking about right we want to avoid that from happening we want to adjust that using our tiling right so because um, this object has a value of two. Let's put this back to one so we can see. All right, so because this, um, this object has a scale value of two, um, it's starting to, it's um, tiling the texture twice, right? It's doing it two times. So we want to take the inverse of our scale value, specifically in the Y direction, uh, and, and assign the inverse to the texture tiling. Well, if anyone doesn't know how to find the inverse, it's just one divided by that number, right? So one divided by two, which is 0.5. Right, so 0.5 in the X and 0.5 in the Y. And that is going to get that texture to conform to that object um, smoothly, right? Now you can see as we move this, it's going to texture and repeat uh, infinitely. So say, for example, we had a wall that's th three units tall right? Take the inverse, right? You'll see it's adjusted like that. The inverse of that, right? So one divided by three or a third, 0 0.3333, 0.3333, right? So you can get that to fit no matter how big or small the wall is, right? Now you definitely want to use the character for this uh, and not just make it massive, right? Like I want a tall wall, you know, I want something that's huge and then tile the, the texture to look, um, um, you know, re unrealistic, right? You still want it to be, be believable uh, in a modern space. So this one over here, um, again, this is two units tall. Let's set this to 0. 0.5. And again, notice how when we adjust these, it's not changing everything. It's just changing that object. Really, really helpful. All right, so I want to adjust the directional light on this just for when I'm, notice when I'm testing, the light is, it's very dark right now, uh, and I want it just to be increased a little bit just so I can see, express definitely for the video. So what I'm going to do is check out the scene, right? Always ask yourself, what is it that I'm changing? What is it that I'm working on? And get in the habit of just coming here and checking out what it is that you're changing. 
And now, yes, you are checking out the hub. That's fine if you're doing some testing. Notice that this, is, this class is all separate and contained assignments. So if you make a mistake or something goes wrong, you can very easily just, you know, grab the project again or start the scene again. Uh, it's not like you're losing a month's worth of work. In the future, you know, in level design, you have one month and you're working on the same project. So you want to back it up and have these backups in case things go wrong. So I'm going to turn up the intensity of the light just a little bit. And now I can actually turn on the scene lighting to see what it actually looks like. All right, and I'm also going to just... Um, moving it actually doesn't do anything, if you notice that. When you move a, a directional light, nothing changes. Um, it's all about where it's uh, angled, the angle of it. Let's try that. Is that a little better? All right, that looks pretty good. Yeah, so notice now that, right, um, using the character, that looks pretty good, actually, the three units. Over here, these cinder blocks almost look like bricks now, like they're a bit small. Um, but it's definitely close, right? You can put multiple together and right next to each other and take a look at them to see what it, what it actually looks like when the character is right next to it. All right, so let me go ahead and take this one over here now and I can just show you the same same thing with the other brick right so this this brick can tile in multiple directions right so this one you again want to have a few uh, duplicates out here right and use the character to see what feels correct and then find those those levels of detail All right, when you're blocking out your level, um, start with just the basic geometry, right? But then from there, don't leave corners and things like this unfinished. You can create columns or other pillars uh, or any other assets and uh, encapsulate them to not just make it a, a base little platform like this. So, for example, see how the, the bottom is really dark down there? What I'm going to do is just take this game object... And because I am you know have that texture tiling set up in a way and the, all the movement, and I could go find another texture for this, but just for time's sake, I'm basically just making a small little um, capsule, right? Or a small little, uh, not a capsule, but a small little end cap, you could say, to just add a little bit more to the silhouette and give this thing a little bit more detail. So there I just went from global to local to toggle its direction of where it was scaling from. Uh, we're going to cover that for the wind turbine, but definitely a little helpful right now. All right, so see how just adding that little bit of detail there, um, using basically that texture is just this down here, this dark little strip. So if it looks a little weird up there, and honestly that doesn't look that bad, um, but really it's meant to be viewed from like down here, like this high, right? The player isn't actually going to get up on top of there. Uh, or I would take a different approach. But adding that little detail like that and doing the same little narrow little strip on the edges really can add a lot to your environment um, really quickly. Right? I just duplicated a cube and I'm ready to go. All right, so um, take, the, take the time to uh, actually study the image. Uh, it's located in the announcements. I'll pull up the one for this month. Uh, if you're watching this video, you know, after from you know the month I recorded it, this may not be the same image, um, but all really what's important is that. Um, see if I can get to this quickly in the new LMS announcements. Um, take a look at the overall structures, right? And this is what the focus of this class is. Oh, that didn't even work. Sorry, still getting new new to this. Sorry, getting used to this new system. Um, take a look at the overall structures and uh, and focus on building those, right? That's the, the key to the assignment. Don't overwhelm yourself uh, if you think there's so much going on that it's hard to actually um, build everything or get it to this level of detail. It's not, it's not about getting it to be exact one-to-one. -one. What I want you to focus on first is building the overall structures, right? Just like I did uh, just now with building that small little detail with that little cube, 
Break this down into simple shapes. Focus first on just building the structures. Don't texture anything until the whole scene is built and is, is built with just level blocking meshes. Uh, and then you can take a pass to texture everything. If you look at the assignment, the weight, the most heaviest weight is the objects. So if you turn in a, a scene that looks like this but has no textures, you're, that's basically 50% of the grade, right? So that is the biggest part, the biggest thing to focus on, the biggest takeaway. So focus on all the little details that you see in your image. Uh, if you want to also expand upon what you see, I encourage that, right? Like here we show, like the window, you don't even see the other half. Right? It just makes sense to actually build the rest of the window. If it helps you mentally to actually expand upon the rest of this, like maybe this wall goes further, maybe the stairs actually lead up and there's a little landing upstairs or there's more to this environment, I encourage you in the creative space to, to take that and to go with it and enjoy what you're doing. <clears throat> because if this was a film, right? if we were working on a, a movie together, or I'm asking you to, to shoot a scene in my movie, Yes, you can just recreate this scene, and I don't care what's over here. But for a game, it is different, right? We have to take this reference image and then expand upon more of it, right? Like, what if the player is standing right here and turns around? What might they see? You don't have to do that for this assignment, but if you want to, if you want to make this feel like a full world when I'm standing there with the character, feel free. I definitely encourage you, but focus on the image first and then work outwards. All right? So I've done some work on my actual scene and everything. So let me go ahead. I know it doesn't look anything like the image, of course. Um, but let me go ahead and save my progress. Right, I probably should have done so already. So it's always a good thing to ask yourself, how much work do you feel like losing? Right? I don't want to lose very much, definitely not more than a day's worth of work or a few hours. So I recommend every half hour, every hour, just come over here. I'm going to save my scenes. Right now, you'll see those asterisks that were next to the hub and next to the visuals got um, removed. Right, I save my scenes, and um, let's go ahead back to Perforce. Yep, there's a change list that didn't work, and now I can just submit my change list. Right, I'm going to say, working on visual scene, added textures, created objects. Demonstration of LBMs. All right, and I'm going to submit that. So do that three or four times while you're working on this assignment. Don't just check it out, work on it for a few days, and then submit it. That's not really the point of using Perforce, right? Because say I'm working on it, and now all of a sudden something crashes and Unity wipes out some of your work, you have nothing to go back to. But now I'll always have this progress saved. If, if something happens to my computer or something happens with Unity and it just crashes and the scene gets corrupted, I have this version. I have what I just submitted. So now I'm going to come back and um, let's just check out the scene again because I'm going to talk about this player start icon quickly. And then I'm going to make an executable to wrap up the end of the video. So in the scene, you have this small little player start icon. When you're done, when you're ready to actually turn this in, or when you're actually building your camera, this is what I'm judging you on for the camera. So you don't have to create, don't create a camera and put it in the scene. You'll notice if I do that and test this, because if the people that actually uh, take the time to create the camera don't ever actually test this, and uh, it will break. It will break in the other... Um, in the actual executable. Notice how you're getting that error. There's two uh, cameras loaded. Because I think what's happening is they're positioning the camera where they want it to, right? Like adjusting this like this. But I'm not going to use a camera. I'm going to use the player's camera, right? So when you make an executable, it's going to cut to this camera, but the player will still be able to run around. So it may not happen in the build, but in a camera or an actual executable, it's going to break our camera system, right? You'll see this, this warning down here. There's two audio listeners. So don't create a camera. If you want to, to kind of get an idea for it, okay, um, but delete it when you make the build. Move this where you want me to stand to judge your, your shot, right? So you'd probably, you know, move it to where I could see the stairs and the, the window and the door all in that shot. So it doesn't need to be exact. I'm not going to be extremely critical. I'm just going to go to that area, right? So say I move it here, 
So I'm just going to run up with the character, and I'll show you pretty much exactly the process I'll go through. Right? I'll stand here, you know, I'll gauge, you know, look about, you know, 30, you know, do about a shot like this, look around the area, get a feel for what you've got, you know, zoom in, get the sense of what you've created, and then that's what I'm judging you on from the camera, is if you represented that. So if you want to do some things to try and fake it, right, like um, by, you know, just showing it from this angle and faking other things, you can. Um, but I, I encourage you to really think about when you're going to, if this was a scene or an environment in your level that you're building, um, build it from that approach and how you would uh, put everything together. All right, so now on to making a build. So I just moved my player start icon. I'm going to save this. <clears throat> so we've made a few changes if you've taken this course in the past. This S Core Level Manager, right? So this script is just a game object in the hub scene. Uh, this name, Level Manager, is very common in the industry. This often just refers to an empty game object with some script or some functionality on it that the level is, is using, right, or something in, on a global scale. This here is a script that we have that basically when the hub loads, on start, this uh, script is going to run and load additional scenes, load scene additively. If you look it up inside of uh, Unity's documentation, uh, load scene additive, it's the scene manager, right? This is what we're actually doing, right? Scene manager. Here we go. Unity's document right there. So here we go. The load scene, and then here is the name of the scene it loads, and then this mode, load scene additive. This is going to allow us to have two scenes present at once. Here when we're in... Unity, right? This is just editing, right? We can see two scenes while we're editing, but we want the executable to actually load that scene um, at the same time, not one at a time. So how this works is this is in conjunction with the build settings. If I go to File, Build Settings, right, yours may look like this, or actually, let me uh, go to Perforce, and again, check out whatever it is you're changing. So the editor build settings are actually in your project settings. All right, so assets, assets for all the game, project settings, this is where the actual build settings are. When you make changes in this window, like I just did, um, you're actually changing this file. So I'm going to go ahead and check out my build settings. This is, again, just really good practice to get into. All right, so yours may look like the hub scene as well as the LD student scene. I think by default that's what it might be. So what we want to do is we want to include all the scenes we want to load in here. So I'm going to go ahead and add open scenes. And we don't necessarily need this LD student so you can remove it. So you can uncheck it or you can just hit function delete on your keyboard. What's important to understand is the hub scene needs to be the first scene in the index, right? Index zero. So make sure that's the first in the list. And then the other scenes you want to load in addition to this uh, are listed afterwards. This is just like what you're going to do um, for DES 3 and level design, but you're getting practice, right? So Envision, here's the hub, and then here's Susie's level, then next is Bobby's level, then next is Johnny's level, and they all are physically connected to each other, right? And this is just getting practice with this. So when you're all done and you're all ready to turn in, right, I'm going to go ahead and hit build. All right, so it's going to ask you where do you want to actually build this to. So you can navigate to your compiled folder, right? Go to your section. And let's go ahead and turn in, let's turn in section two this time. All right, so I'm going to go to compiled, right, and visuals. Inside of this visuals folder, go ahead and create a new folder. The reason why is because when you generate your build, it creates two things. It creates an ex actual executable file, and then it also creates... Uh, a, 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 a data folder, excuse me. And all that data uh, is important to run with the EXE. You have to turn in both of them to Perforce for me to submit, uh, to actually grade your work as well as view what you've turned in or view the work you've done. So I'm going to create this folder here, right? Just last name, first name, visuals. That's the name naming convention for the class is just last name, first name, and the name of the assignment. In this folder, I'm just going to save my exe, right? Save it as last name, first name, visuals. 
hit save. Unity is going to build. All right, and while that's building, I'm going to take the time to actually submit my my working um, assignments or my working uh, changes to my project, the actual project itself. So I'm going to go ahead and submit. Say edited build settings and moved player start. All right, being very detailed. That way when I submit, right now I already have a bunch of changes to my scene. Let me just go look at just my scene file, right, and by using the history. So I'm going to close my submitted change lists and my workspaces for now. If you ever need any of these, you can open them. But I like to at least have files, pending, and history open uh, at all times. So I'm just going to go look at my scenes. I already have five revisions of it. All right, and now this one shows every single change that I've done. And if, because I've been so detailed, I know what each one of these ones, or at least it's a reminder to me, of what I actually did. And I, if I ever need number four, number three, I have um, that rollback, rollback to revision. All right, now my build is done, I think. Yep, just like uh, those TV shows where you, oh, I didn't actually submit though. Oh, yes, I did. It's, yeah, it's like one of those TV shows where you put it in and they walk right next to it and now it's, the other one's done. So I'm gonna go ahead and test this right very very important to actually test this don't uh, just assume oh well the level manager does it for me um, still try it out make sure it works make sure the lighting is looking how you want it make sure everything is functioning as as it should make sure your character is working sometimes things might just be off um, it's worth just testing if it doesn't work you can troubleshoot the issue or you know try making another build but at least test and make sure everything is showing up as intended all right now this looks just like I did and had an editor. Notice how these scenes are both physically connected, right? That's the level manager actually running and loading the hub scene additively. All right? And now this is my build. I'm ready to turn in, right? I've tested it, ready to turn in. So there it is in my folder structure. Let me go to Perforce. All right? And now I put that one in section 2, compiled. I'll go to the workspace. All right, and now there's that folder showing up, right? So let me go back and talk about what the EXE is. Right here's that EXE, right? That's the actual executable. Here's the data folder. Hopefully this is a review. You don't need to know what each one of these folders do. You don't, there's no test question saying, what is the resources folder? And what does this file do? Uh, none of that. But what you need to understand is this data folder needs to be uh, next to, right next to uh, the, the EXE itself. Or if it's in another folder somewhere in your computer, that connection is lost. They need to be side by side in the same folder. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and mark this for add. Remember, not just the data folder, not the visuals folder, but the, uh, the folder that contains the exe and the data. All right, mark for add. All right, now you see it's popping up. I think that's just a visual bug with, with my Perforce right now. Um, but yeah, now you see there's the exe mark for add as well as all of the data folder. So now when I submit, say adding visuals assignment, or adding visuals exe and data. Now that will submit. This works. Once this submits, I'm going to show the process of, again, how to just test it even further of what you've uh, turned into the depot. Alrighty, now that my submission has gone through and it's submitted to Perforce, 
Now there's a few things you can do to actually test what's on the depot. All right, so I'm going to show this folder in Explorer. All right, and make sure it's all contained in this folder. If you submitted yours and it's outside and you haven't created a folder, you can use that rename slash move feature to move it somewhere else. Right, make sure it's in um, one contained folder. All right now in the Explorer, all right. Now you'll see, let me go ahead and, you know, when you test the game, when you test the EXE, right, you're testing what's on your computer, right, this window will pop up. I'll show you what will happen if I delete your, if you delete your data folder or say you just turn in your EXE and I try and run your EXE just that, that's what you're going to get, right, data folder not found, there's an error. This is going to be a zero for, for the, the grade for the assignment, of course, but uh, what's more important is this would be like a zero for, you know, your milestone for your, your company, right, so. And that, that zero is a lot more impactful. So um, just understand you have to turn in the data folder with the executable or you just cannot run the EXE. Right? So if you've submitted your work to Perforce, right, you've submitted everything, you see it in the depot, you see the 101 every, the, uh, icon with the green dot next to everything, you're always, at any time, you're safe to delete your work from your computer like I just did. I know that sounds scary, right? I just deleted my own work but um, that's if it's on the depot it's there even if someone marks it for delete and submits it it's still there we can still get it back right if your work is submitted you're safe to um, to delete your work at any time right now if I want to test what's on the depot and that's part of the process of testing what's on the depot is deleting it if I do get latest revision notice again I get that no files updated you can do it over and over again because Perforce thinks I have version one of one. So again, you need to use the get revision and force operation, and that's going to copy it right to my computer. Right. So this is a good way to test it yourself. So I'm deleted it from my computer, copied it back onto my computer from the depot, and now I can run it and test it to see exactly what I'm going to see when you turn it in. Um, if you, you know, this is the best way to do it if you're by yourself. If you have any friends or any, uh, any other classmates that you can just say, hey, can you go ahead and grab my submission and test it, see if it works. I'm sure you can find someone to do it, to exchange that uh, with. But yeah, that's the way to do it on your own is to delete it from your computer and get revision. All right. Best of luck to you and contact your instructor or myself if you have any issues with Perforce or this assignment.